אני גאה ונרגש להגיד שלום לפרופסור נורינה הרץ. It's great to have you with us at our conference, Norina. It's great to be with you. So what do you mean exactly when you talk about loneliness? Who feels alienated and from whom? From what? So we all are feeling lonely right now, or at least each of us is experiencing loneliness either directly um, or through our friends or families or colleagues. The figures are really quite astounding. In the United States, three in five adults feel lonely often or always. One in five millennials don't have a single friend. Yeah. And you may think that Israel is, you know, perhaps not part of this trend, but actually studies that have done global comparisons show that Israel is one of the loneliest countries in the world. Wow. And, you know, COVID-19 has amplified loneliness over the past year, but signs of the problem were very evident even earlier. Absolutely. We... have built a lonely world from the way we've designed our cities to um, the way that we live or don't live together. People do less with other people than in the past. More people live alone. Um, less people are members of trade unions. Uh, less people go to synagogue or church than ever did before. So we do less with each other. Um, and that's part of the problem. But of course, there's something else that's new in recent years, and it's our smartphones, it's social media. And that may be part of the reason why Israel is particularly bad on the loneliness front, because you're, of course, also one of the countries in the world with the highest um, smartphone usage and social mm -hmm. media usage. And, and when I began my research, I wasn't sure whether social media really was a problem when it came to loneliness. Um, but having spent a few years digging into it and digging into the research, I now feel sure that it is. Um, there was a study done recently by Stanford University mm -hmm. where they had 1,500 people who were told to use their Facebook like usual. It was students. The other 1,500 were told to stop using it for two months. The group that stopped using it were significantly happier, significantly less lonely. And in fact, quitting Facebook was almost half as beneficial to them as it would have been if they'd attended therapy. You know, it's a little, a little baffling because how could it be that the most connected century ever is also the loneliest? What exactly is the effect of Facebook, Twitter and other social platforms in this respect? Well, that's the great um, irony, isn't it? Yes. I think it's in part to do with the quality of the interactions on these medium. They're almost like fast food interactions. So we gorge on Facebook and Twitter. But in the same way that if we were eating loads of hamburgers, we wouldn't feel full. It's that same feeling when we're communicating mainly on social media. Another problem is, of course, how addictive these platforms are. We've all been guilty of it. sitting in the room with our loved ones, um, heads in our phones, not really even hearing them, not being present with them. So social media and our devices are eroding the quality of our relationships with people when we're actually in a room with them. There was research done where a phone was put on the table between a couple, even when the phone was turned off, and even when neither of the couple was touching the phone, the couple felt less connected to each other. Mm -hmm. and less empathetic. And then, of course, there's the fact that these platforms actually incentivize hatred, abuse, bullying. In the United Kingdom, 65% of students have experienced cyberbullying. And I interviewed for my book many teenagers whose stories were very painful of how, for example, a 14-year-old boy told me about how He'd post on Instagram and then be waiting, 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 hoping for somebody to like his posts. And when nobody did, he'd ask himself, what am I doing wrong? And feel so invisible. Social media makes us feel that everyone is more popular than us. And so that we are and makes us feel lonely. So, so at the bottom line, we feel lonely and, and it's mainly relevant for younger generations. And I'm asking you, what are the results of loneliness? How does it change people? So to be clear, loneliness does affect the young the most, but the elderly are affected too, um, men, women, 
rich and poor, although there is a relationship between poverty and loneliness as well. But it affects us not just mentally, which we might expect loneliness is linked to increased rates of depression and anxiety, and even at worst, suicide, but it also affects us physically. Loneliness is as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Because when we're lonely, our body goes into fight or flight mode because we're not designed to be lonely. So um, our blood pressure goes up, our cortisol levels, our stress hormones in our body goes up, our heart beats faster, all of which are our body telling us, don't be alone. The trouble is that nowadays many people are alone, are feeling lonely for protracted periods of time, which is why it's so bad for our health. We're remaining in that state of high alert when we're in loneliness for weeks or months or even years. And, and you also connect loneliness to political views, right? I mean, do you observe the same tendencies globally? So um, loneliness, one of the things that came out in my research was actually fascinating. The link between loneliness and the rise of right-wing populism. So the rise of leaders like Donald Trump in the United States or um, Marine Le Pen in France. This is really because there is a group of people who are craving community, who feel lonely, not only in the sense that they are missing friends and family, but they also feel marginalized, unseen, unheard by politicians, by the state. And right-wing populists in particular have really played to this constituency, wielding community like a weapon, offering them community. Think about Trump rallies with everyone wearing the same outfits and the same hats, chanting the same songs, speaking to the loneliness that this group have um, with obviously worrying consequences for all of us. Norina Hertz, any solutions? So many solutions. My book is full of solutions. My book has um, many ideas in it. Ideas that governments can act upon from things they need to do to revitalize our local independent shops and restaurants, even more important now, of course, than ever, from things they should do vis-a-vis -vis social media. I think social media is the tobacco industry of the 21st century and should be regulated as such when it comes to children. Things that governments can do when it comes to redesigning our cities so that they feel less lonely for their inhabitants but also so much that we as individuals can do. We can put down our phones, be more present with each other. I know it's hard given the addiction, but just try, move it, move it outside so that it's not in arm's reach. Second thing we can do, especially important right now, really think about how we can help our local community stores, cafes and restaurants. I mean, they are struggling, they are on their knees, given the double whammy of the pandemic and the shift to e-commerce. But we need local places that we can come together, be together, if we are to feel connected. So we have to try and help them. And third, think, is there anyone in your own network who might be feeling particularly lonely right now? And if there is, pick up the phone to them, even send them a text, if you are allowed to, meet up with them in a socially distanced way, just showing someone that you're there for them, that you care for them, that they're visible, can make a huge difference to how they feel. I think those notions should be given some space and time to echo a little bit inside, inside our minds and brains and hearts. Uh, Professor Norina Hertz from London, thank you so much for this so interesting and moving conversation. Thank you.